guys. Welcome back to another junior, junior developer happy hour. And I can never say it, but we'll get there someday. In case you don't know what we're all about, we're just an AMA for anybody who is looking to get into tech. Um, both of us recognize how it can be pretty tricky getting your first job in tech as a developer. And um, we don't want anyone to give up hope so we're here to try to help however we can with at least giving pointing you pointing you in the right direction for information and, and resources and stuff. So um, also, if you haven't been here, uh, Brian is the best and always posts the Slido. That Slido that is the most recent chat in the chat history, open that up in a different tab. That is going to be the best place to post questions to upvote questions so we can uh, prioritize them and, and answer them first. Um, if you have any sort of follow-up questions immediately related to what we're talking about, or if you want to drop some resources, um, that sort of stuff can go in the Zoom chat. Um, for example, the Slack community that we have that Sam just posted. Um, or for example, like my LinkedIn, if you feel like connecting to me there or here, uh, once again, is the YouTube channel that this will eventually be posted to. Um, so feel free to subscribe if you're able to, and want to stay until the very end, that's when we'll invite people to come off of mute and we'll stop recording and stuff. And people can have maybe more of a more natural conversation, um, towards the end. So, yep, I think that's all. I already said that I was an engineer at Nordstrom. I'm uh, full stack, have done a lot of focus on the front end though. Recently, uh, we use TypeScript, React, um, and I think that's all you need to know about that. I've went to Dev Bootcamp myself in 2017. So with that, I will let Sam introduce himself. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Sam. Uh, I am a front end developer currently on sabbatical. Um, but uh, I am doing a coding challenge on Monday because an awesome company is hiring. So I decided to throw my hat into the ring because I really like that company. Um, it's a payments, com payments app company. It's called Strike. Um, they're, they're building um, something using the Bitcoin network and it's super interesting. So um, I just sent in an application and I talked to them earlier this week and they're gonna send me a coding challenge on Monday. Um, so maybe I won't be on sabbatical. <laughs> I was planning on taking a long sabbatical, but um, maybe not. Uh, but yeah, I was most recently at Lyft. I quit in December to take a sabbatical. Uh, indefinite sabbatical. I wasn't sure how long I was going to do it, um, um, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, I also went to the bootcamp, but long time ago, 2013. Uh, I also have a computer science degree, which I got a long time ago and I never used it. <laughs> so I failed to break into the industry uh, after I graduated. I gave up too quickly uh, and then many years later, after I did the Peace Corps and lived in West Africa uh, and did a whole bunch of other stuff, um, uh, that's when coding boot camps like came out. Dev boot camp was the first coding boot camp that spawned, that came up with the idea. Um, so they spawned all the boot camps. So I was lucky to go pretty early in 2013. And then after that, I did a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so. I've worked at like a, a few different companies full time, done contract work and tried to help my friends start a startup and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, let's get to our special guest. We got two special guests this week. So I don't know who wants to go first. Um, we got Awful um, and we got Jason. And maybe give a background and also tell us a little bit about um, Free Code Camp uh, oh, yeah. SF. Certainly. Um, so I'll go first. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Sarafika. Um, as you can see from the meetup headline, I am one of the co-organizers of Free Code Camp San Francisco. 
We are an open source learning community in the Bay Area with over 4,600 members. And behind me, you can see um, meetups that we used to volunteer at. Um, this one's Node School, which is a meetup focusing on um, learning everything about Node.js and how cool it is. Um, and these next few backgrounds might be scary, but these were all pre-COVID, I promise. So all across San Francisco, we would meet up in offices, warehouses, schools, libraries, and we would all come together to learn um, full stack web development. Um, currently, I am working as an instructional associate at General Assembly, but with the start of the pandemic, I have been kind of surprised adopted by many different teams across General Assembly's US campuses. Um, I'm almost going to be, I'm going to be reaching my one year anniversary um, in a few months after I finish my upcoming cohort. Um, I'm really excited to be on this AMA and I'm excited to see um, what questions come out of this. I was in your seats not too long ago. So I'm really aiming to bring a new perspective to JDHH. So shout out to Sam and Brady for having me. Sweet, thanks for the intro. How about you, <clears throat> Awful? <laughs> All right, so I also uh, am a member of San Francisco Free Code Camp. I am a bit of, uh, I don't know, I move around a lot. So I'm also, right, I'm currently in Arizona and Chandler, Arizona, because I left San Francisco right at the beginning of lockdown. And that, I can, you can ask me that later. It's a, another story. Uh, things that I've done and how I got into tech, I uh, started out teaching financial literacy to children and I loved what I was doing. And I created the curriculum and I wanted to exist, but I didn't want to teach in the classroom anymore. So the goal was to learn to code, to basically create something similar to like a Khan Academy, but strictly on financial literacy. So that's the uh, project that is ever going because uh, I'm still working on that, still learning. And uh, my first job or the last job I had in tech was a developer advocate. And that's where I found my niche uh, doing things like that as I am an ambassador for Free Code Camp on multiple chapters. And I've been blessed with the opportunity to travel and interact with members in chapters, at least in the Americas. So that's one of the benefits I've had. Creating, creating content is how I found my niche within the tech community and helping others get into tech field has also been where I've invested a lot of time as well. I think that's all you guys wanted from us right in the intro, just what we're working on and how we got into tech. Well, um, could you go into a little bit uh, like how you learned how to code? Because you did, <clears throat> you're self-taught, right? Like how did, what? Yes. How did you do yes. that? <laughs> well, so I started learning while I was teaching the children. So I was teaching them financial literacy, but I also wanted them to have an actual skill. So the goal was teach them how to code so they can start their own business and also learn how businesses work from the financial literacy that I was teaching them. So using code.org and Khan Academy, I was learning to code while teaching them to code. And then that's when I realized that if I really wanted to do what I want to do, then I needed to focus full time on coding. So I quit the teaching job. I wasn't even an official teacher. I was teaching, but I was a paraprofessional because they couldn't pay me teacher salary because I didn't have the teaching certificates. And that's another story is why I chose not to invest the time and energy into getting teaching certificates. And I'll answer that if you ask. But yeah, so I ended up quitting the job, focused full time on doing the free code camp curriculum and any other free tools that I could find. Um, doing that for about six months. And then I got a call from a company that was offering to pay me to continue learning to code. So I took that job and did that for three months. Uh, got hired by a friend of mine because the, on the only dev that worked for the company needed help. And he wanted to work with me because we got along. So I worked with them for three months. And then my friend called me and told me they can no longer afford to keep me on staff. And before that, I had decided that I was gonna leave the country anyway. So I ended up choosing to leave the country instead of paying expensive US rents and focus full time on becoming a better developer. And I did that for about five or six months, 
came back to the US, worked independently doing projects, and then got offered another job where they paid me to learn to code. So I did that for, I think, four or five months until I decided. Uh, how did how did these companies find you? <laughs> <laughs> how did they find me? Oh, uh, well, yeah. I'm, I was active in the Phoenix. No, it's AZ Devs Slack channel because that's when that's where I was when this journey started. And just talking to people, letting them know that what I was working on and I was looking for opportunities and just paying attention to the stuff that people were sharing in there. And they would share things about, I'm looking for this job or I'm working with this company and they're looking to bring on this amount of people. And, and that was one of the tips that uh, someone gave me. His name is Brad Westfall, he's on Twitter. And one of the tips he gave me is pay attention to projects and opportunities that people share. And even if you can't do it, or you don't think you can, say you can and then figure it out while on the job. So that's, it's a gamble, right? Cause you can definitely burn bridges that way. But if you come through and you show and prove, you can build relationships. And I've been fortunate enough that I've yet to torture bridge, at least in tech doing that. So uh, the first project I did that on was a chat bot. I did for a nonprofit and that was an experience. And I have a great story about negotiating and when you went to know when you've screwed up negotiating and that just to save you guys the time is when they accept your first offer. So if they accept your first offer, then you underbid yourself. But with that chatbot project, they wanted to add more stuff, more features to the chatbot. And that was where I was able to get back some of that money but not enough because they again accept the first offer on the uh, on the adjusted fees. So aim high, you know, and be willing to stick to your guns when negotiating. Know your, know your worth, I guess is the, is the key thing. And then um, just one more thing. Could you tell us a little bit about your morning show that you have? Your bio says you have yeah, a morning so show. Yeah, so I've done a bunch of, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's part of a long term project I'm working on. I'm and the morning show is just me talking about tech tools, uh, working on open source projects and showing the journey on doing that. It's an ever evolving project. So yeah, it's, uh, I'm targeting software developers or people in the tech industry. And basically want to share the cool things that we do outside of staring at computers for hours upon hours. <laughs> so I'll, I'll share things about my travels. I'll share cool things about the side projects I work on, the cool side projects that the people that I meet in tech work on. And by side projects, I'm not just talking about uh, the, what, the next Uber for this. It could be a book that someone's writing or a photo project or, a music video or a song that some, one of us is making. So it's it's called The Awful Morning Show and awful is full of life. I like to make up words and I took the prefix awe uh, and the suffix full and put those together. So <laughs> full of life, full of joy is where the name comes from. And that's and, what um, the morning show will be about. And where do you broadcast it from? on my Twitch and my YouTube channel. And Awful Brown is the name of the channel. Yeah. Do you have a link to either of those you could put in the chat? Yeah. I'm going to share the, the link to my site because I'd much rather promote myself than Twitch or YouTube. And from there, you can find <laughs> all things awful. <laughs> Sweet. Sounds yeah. awesome. All right, thanks really for the intros. Good. Ready, you wanna start up the, the AMA? Sure. We only got yeah. two questions so far. You guys gotta <laughs> come up with lacking questions this week. We'll, we'll, I guess it will start flowing once people start. It, I yeah. To pull out, um, that this is a very good question that we've got. Okay, yeah, we can start with that one. Um, I was also going to check, cause I know that you had brainstormed a couple of things that you were hoping to be able to talk about. Um, so if you would want to say anything, any words on, 
any of the topics you'd thought about, now could be a good time while we only have two questions, or we can jump straight into the questions, whichever you prefer. Okay, um, so let's look at what's going on in the chat. I'm seeing a lot of people plugging their LinkedIn's. Um, this is a good way to get like a number of connections very quickly, but I'm going to ask, when you put your LinkedIn link, why should we connect with you besides becoming another number and the number of connections that you have? So you're, you're suggesting that they uh, add to the, to their link or? Um... Yeah. So I'm all for creating connections, but I also want to know why I'm connecting with. If any of you um, read my LinkedIn page before coming on, you might have seen a line that said like, I need a message for me to connect with you. And when I see your LinkedIn page, like I'm not gonna have all this time to read. I want a good first impression of you, right? So let's think about, let's rethink about posting our LinkedIn's in the chat because I know this red bubble is showing up a lot. So we can say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm a student at this coding bootcamp or I'm a recent grad. I'm currently working with code for America's local brigade. Um, that will help us identify um, who would be helpful on this chat. Um, in addition, I'm happy to talk about my experiences like going through a boot camp. As I mentioned before, I've come full circle where I went to General Assembly and I came back later as an instructor. Um, I also have Anthony who could bring us the perspective of being a self-taught dev. Um, so we are both coming from these very different viewpoints on getting into tech, right? And like Sam, I had to struggle a lot to get into this field. And I have been in, um, in the audience at JDAH um, there's plenty of advice that's constantly being repeated. Be ready to learn, be ready to compete. All this right. is a challenging field. Like um, every year, coding boot camps, CS programs, they're producing thousands of candidates for um, all these open positions. And we're here to figure out how we can take, how we can leverage our backgrounds to get into this field, right? Cool. Um... Yeah, so like what sorts of things did you do uh, to make yourself stand out then, I guess? Yeah, so um, before I attended General Assembly, I attended, I first learned how to code at a free code camp meetup, which I went to after graduating from college. Um, oh, we can see I'm getting some stuff in the chat. Um, so when I went to my first free code camp meetup, it was astonishing. Like there was all these people with MacBooks, and they were talking about stuff I didn't understand. Like I didn't know what JavaScript or HTML was. Um, so for me, it was a very sink or swim situation, and I had to learn how to code very quickly if I wanted to hang around this meetup group in Free Code Camp. Um, so I used Free Code Camp's curriculum, and if any of you have used it, you kind of know that the difficulty curve is like this. It's very exponential, right? Um, so. I had no STEM background. Um, let's say that, um, I'll say that I stopped math at calculus, but um, seeing code, it was just like scary. And how am I supposed to do deal with this, right? So um, what, I went, what I tried to do was I tried to stay consistent. I would go to a meetup every week, once for free code camp. And I would go to a meetup for industries that I was really interested in. Um, I'm lucky enough to live in the Bay Area where all these companies are hosting meetups to promote their products. And it was just exciting. There's like all these new innovations going on in downtown San Francisco. And that's what I, really when I knew, okay, I want to go into tech. I want to learn how to code and I want to make a name for myself and I want to make space for the communities that I represent. And um, so Sasha, I'm getting this question. Are you willing to talk about your experience being queer and how that affected your transition to tech? Yes, so um, as a lot of people do know, I volunteered a lot with Out in Tech. I volunteered with their youth mentorship program um, this past fall. It was an amazing experience because um, a lot of my mentees, they went through a lot of the same struggles that I did with resolving their identities, with trying to understand that they can make a space for themselves in tech. And the way that we make ourselves, uh, the way that we make space for ourselves is through our skills and talent um, and our unique perspectives. Because the way that all these new innovations, these are shaping the ways that we lead our lives. And we want to have a say in this innovations and how they are being developed, right? So that's a little bit about my motivations about why I wanted to go into tech and how I got started. Um, it is a very long journey um, that I had with Free Code Camp. And eventually when I started volunteering um, and started organizing my own Free Code Camp meetups, that's when I realized, okay, if I wanna do this seriously, I might need a little bit more polish 
that's why I started looking into attending a coding boot camp. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with what I call the finishing school route, where um, you come in with a little bit uh, more prepared than some people. Like you understand JavaScript, what a function is, and how to make a web page. That's actually why I recommend if you are considering a boot camp option. And what courses did you do on Free Code Camp? Um, so on Free Code Camp, um, this was before they revised some certifications, but I went for their full stack certification where it starts off where you make that web page about cats, right? And then I went on um, for the front end portion, and then I took some time to research React. This was before they had the React curriculum, I think. And then after that, I went in for the back end to learn Express and Node. And then um, after that came like those endless coding challenges, right? All right, we could uh, jump into questions at this point. All right. I have a question. Oh yeah, share with that, Matt. Hi, my name is Matt. Yeah. Um, so I heard you mention um, coding challenges. So does anyone have like a good site or something where we can go and do coding challenges to kind of get maybe a feel of where we are or is there any resources for that kind of thing? Sure, I do have a sub advice for that. Um, I recommend going to the glass door of the company that you're interested in working at and try to find out what interview questions show up for the position that you're trying to pursue. Um, you'll find that a lot of companies have a favorite interviewing platform and um, some of the interview questions you find in Glassdoor might be the ones that you will be asked. I try to use for coding practice and getting, I use Code Wars and that's one that I use and I've used more than, what's the hacker rank is another good one. I don't use that one often, but I've used it in the past as well for coding challenges. Yeah, Code Signal is my favorite. Um, and if you weren't here for our JDHH with Tigran Sloyan, it's on Brady's YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe and hit the bell button and smash the like button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the PR cracks me up. <laughs> cool, I'm gonna read out this first question here. Um, do you think job seekers overthink resumes? This person finds themselves constantly making a new one. Do you recommend just sticking with something plain and concise? Yeah, um, from my experience, like resumes have, are always like a tricky point because you really want to customize your resume to fit the position, right? Um, my advice for this question, and I hope this is relevant, is to keep a master resume where you have everything, all your projects, all the achievements that you've made so far, it can tell her which ones match the position best. For example, if you were going for like a support engineering position, you would talk about um, skills that would highlight how good you are at reading documentation or helping a client through a problem, right? I like that idea for the, the variation also. Um, I think that I, I, I'll help people sometimes tweaking their resumes and I don't necessarily know how other people are going to read a resume. And um, yeah, I, I like the idea of having the different copies so you can just send multiple copies out and see what traction is, uh, like which one gets more traction basically. Um, resumes can be tricky, yeah. Yeah. All right, next one then. Next question is what skills would you suggest we learn to stay relevant in the field? The skills I recommend are be, try to be as proficient as possible with one language because that'll help you. Usually that one language will allow you to learn all the skills you need and will transition for other languages, right? So if you start with JavaScript and the job that they're hiring for isn't JavaScript, it might be Python or it might be Java. They're completely different languages, but the principles are all there for all the languages. Like they all have reserved words. You know, they all have error messages. You know, you're going to do for loops and while loops or some variation of that. It may not have the same name, but the principles, the fundamentals are the same pretty much for all languages. So what I've been told and what I've learned in my experience is that 
be proficient with one language and then start adding other tools from there. And if, and you don't have to be full stack. Like if you wanna be the best backend developer that you can possibly be or the best front end developer, then, then do that. But yes, just try to be, choose something, just probably be as proficient as that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think that for me, that was useful. That's great advice. Um, how did you, either of you decide, I just remember when I was beginning having no clue about really what the difference was between backend and front end or how to decide if I should go one way or another. Do you have any tips for that? Yeah, so um, if you are in that position of like, what should I learn front end or back end? I would recommend learning full stack anyway, since um, that will help you understand how everything in an application works together. Uh, once you have um, exposure to both what the back end is doing and the front end, you'll understand how they work in tandem. You can decide which part you would like to work more in. For example, even if you learn front end, you still have to understand how data is coming in from the back end. Like, say you're getting results from the API, you need to render it in a web page. Uh, for the people who are doing a total career change, how do you recommend staying motivated while learning new languages and avoiding burnout? Oh my, this is a good question because like um, burnout, that is a serious issue. Um, but you really have to adopt this mindset. And I know this has been said so many times on Junior Developer Happy Hour, learning to learn is such an important skill. And um, this profession, you need a lot, you need to keep learning a lot to stay on top of your game. Yeah. I would add that uh, I think there's a, I know there's a course called Learning to Learn on EDX, and I think they have a book out as well. And that was one of the things that helped me in my journey, because I started that EDX class before I started all the other coding yeah. uh, class courses I was taking. And it helped me get a better understanding of the way that I enjoy learning or the most efficient way for me to learn. So that helped with me not getting burned out and also being patient with yourself and remembering that slow motion is better than no motion so you don't have to do like if the course says you know do this three hours a day or do this an hour a day three days a week for four weeks if that's if you don't have room in your schedule to do that still take the course but maybe do 15 minutes a day you know and start, or maybe start out just watching short five minute YouTube videos on different coding concepts so that, you know, you at least have a, a small foundation and then work your way up to doing it full time if you're just starting out. Because you can get burnt out with the hours upon hours of information that's out there and available for free. Yeah, I think it also helps to, um figure out how to make it enjoyable, <laughs> find stuff that you um, really like working on. Um, it's hard to get burnt out, harder to get burnt out, I think, if you're like having fun, right? Um, so if you can find stuff that makes it enjoyable. I also find it really helpful to set up a good workstation um, just so you have like a comfortable place to do work. Um, I think that helps like prevent burnout too, because it's just, it's just like you get into your comfort and then you just work on stuff that's fun. Um, I, I think that helps. It also helps to have a schedule that way, you know, you, you know, when you're going to do it and that way you don't feel like you're neglecting this task or this activity. Like say if it's a half hour from four to 4.30 after work, or maybe you do a half hour before work or before you go to bed. And if you're consistent in just meeting your schedule, over time, you'll see yourself progress. And you'll get to the point where your, your brain muscles that have to do with coding, they gain endurance. So you can eventually do more than a half hour, right? Because if you're coming from something completely different from coding, It'll, it'll take time to train your body and your mind to start to grasp these concepts and not get exhausted or just spend a half hour reading something and then look back and realize you don't understand anything that you just invested a half hour into. 
that uh, slow motion is better than no motion. It sounds like, have, have you ever read Atomic Habits? Or uh, do you know what that's about? The like I'm make just, small habits. I'm, my headphones died when you were talking. What did you say? <laughs> I was wondering if you've ever read Small Habit or Atomic Habits. No, I haven't read Atomic Habits. Okay. It's, it sounds like a similar concept where like start small, just make a little bit of progress every day. We've talked about it a couple of times on the meetup here. It sounds similar. <laughs> I did read this other book about how to teach yourself good habits. And it says to focus on the triggers, not on the habit. An example, if I could give you one is uh, the first time I used it is I wanted to start drinking more water. So what I would do is when I woke up the trigger was waking up. So as soon as I woke up, I would drink water. So that was my trigger. And eventually got to the point where it was automatic. And it's a great thing to do. I don't know if you know the health benefits of drinking water before you eat or drink anything else in the morning, but make sure you have some time because when you first start doing it, it's going to force your body to poop and everything is going to flush out. So it's a good thing to do, but just make sure you got some time to do that before you need to be anywhere else. All kinds of tips here. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm learning so much. <laughs> All right, here's the next question. Um, for us graduates, we're transitioning from structured learning to having to teach ourselves. How do we build a curriculum for ourselves? Ooh, um, so when you're transitioning from graduating from a Coney boot camp, you have like the structure, right? You go in day to day and you know what you're being taught because you have a syllabus. Now, when you move into teaching yourself, um, my recommend is like thinking about, okay, what did I learn at my boot camp, and how can I grow beyond that? So really think about like what skills that um, your boot camp might not have covered that would be of interest to you. Like, would you be interested in DevOps, um, cloud infrastructure? Um, there's all these amazing certifications that you can pursue um, following a coding boot camp. Like um, some people go for the Amazon Cloud Architect certifications. Um, there's some other ones from different cloud providers. Um, that's, those are some of uh, the recommendations I do have. Um, you can also think about like what skills would you like to brush up on before you head into an interview. Um, data structures and algorithms was like, oh my gosh, I need to level that up so much. When I finished General Assembly, I would be terrified by coding challenges. I still do, to be honest. I still do too. I'm <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, with uh, with this, like it's, it's a muscle, like they say that you're gonna be constantly learning in tech. So it'll be challenging at first. I wouldn't try to create a curriculum because there are so many good ones already out there. And you can save yourself some time and just like Jason said, what is the thing that you're that you're not strong in that you feel will help you get the job or what job is it that you want and then what skills do you need to be strong in or proficient in to acquire that job those are that's how i would approach that i wouldn't try to create a curriculum i would just figure out what skills i need to have or want to have to be where i want to be and then find someone who has already created that curriculum so that I could follow it. Like I say, you got the AWS uh, certificates that are out there. Free Code Camp has certifications. On Monday, I'm starting the Free Code Camp uh, D, D, 3DJS, I think is what it is, the 13-hour video that was just launched. So I'm going to be doing that myself because that's a tool that I've been wanting to, to learn for a while. And I've gone about in bits and pieces, but now that there's a whole 12 hours or 13 hours together, I can just use that as my curriculum to learn that skill. Yeah, you can also learn by just failing an interview and then seeing <laughs> what you need to, um, what skills you need to get better at. Um, that's one way to learn. You just go into the interview, bomb it, notice all the things that you're really weak on, and then you can work on those things. And you can do other things too, just like do hackathons and then. I think mint, I haven't done a mint bean hackathon, but like it, it seems fun. A lot of people like uh, seem to have fun doing it um, based on posts I see on LinkedIn. 
So you can do those kind of things to like find interesting stuff to work on. And then just by doing that, by working on projects, you, you got to learn a whole bunch of stuff to do like a project from end to end from scratch, right? So by doing that, you learn a bunch of stuff and then you should also like find stuff that you, that interests you. And then you can de dive deeper down those rabbit holes. Um, so, and just by hanging out in slacks and on Twitter and LinkedIn, people post all kinds of stuff, right? Like, so like something might pop out to you as interesting. Like people post about all kinds of technology. So you can just hang out in communities and then stuff might just become interesting. Um, I don't know if you need to develop a curriculum kind of just, I just personally, I just go into like rabbit holes. <laughs> just um, make sure you crawl out if you find out that you're not actually interested in that thing. Cause I've done that before where uh, I went into a deep learning rabbit hole for like a year because deep learning was the hotness and it was like really cool, right? All the stuff you can do with deep learning. Um, but then I crawled out of that hole after about a year because um, I decided I like web development better. Um, but yeah. All very good I, advice. Oh, oh, Oops, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say another thing you could do is build something that you're gonna use because in every interview I've had, I've been asked about other things that I'm working on that aren't work related. And if it's something that you actually enjoy working on, the passion that you have for that project will come through in the interview. And that can add value to the experience for the interviewers. Because when they call you in for that interview, they want you to be the one that they hire so they can stop interviewing people, right? So they're rooting for you. So if you have a project that even if it's has no value for anyone outside of you, but if you can go in there and talk about the things that you learned working on this thing that only you care about. And those same skills might not be, those same skills will be of value when you work with that company, right? How you uh, write your tests for your personal project, how you uh, find bugs and solve those bugs. And if you're practicing how to do, uh, man, what's it called? I can't even remember now. Is uh, the uh, process, not waterfall. What's the process? Agile. Agile. Yeah. yeah, if you practice agile, even by yourself, by doing solo standups, right? Those are all things that you can talk about in the interview about your project. Yeah, I interviewed at Lyft for front end positions. I did the initial like technical phone screens and we started all the interviews with talking about a project that you recently w worked on. Very good. Um, how can someone most successfully use free CodeCamp? Okay, so um, for this question, um, my recommendation is to um, look through free CodeCamp. Um, the curriculum itself, you can find it at freecodecamp.org slash map. And you can go through each of the sections and find out which skills you are most interested in practicing. Um, that's my recommendation. If I knew a little bit more with the context, like um, how can you use FreeCodeCamp successfully um, like to get started, um, that might be a bit more helpful. Oh yeah, and as Anthony is posting, um, okay, great. All right, so then wait, you said dot map at the end? Yeah, so um, I think the full curriculum can be found at freecodecamp.org slash map. Does it redirect to learn maybe? Yeah, it redirects to learn. The link used to be map, um, but you can see all the different certifications that um, you could look into. Cool. So then someone could just choose which uh, section they want to focus on and then go straight through? Yeah. Cool. Um, so this is what we use our meetups, and this is how we get people started on coding. Um, usually, if you're a beginner, we start you off in responsive web design certification. Um, if you come in with a little more experience, we might um, get you started on front end to start practicing with React. 
or even APIs and microservices if you're interested in backend work. All right. What can you talk a little bit about meetups? Do you all just get together and open up and start working from wherever each person like do people collaborate or is it kind of individual next to each other in case people have questions? Yeah, so um, we've, our meetups have taken a wide variety of formats. Um, for most of them, they are like an open study group where you can drop in with your computer and ask around some questions. We really want it to be a friendly space um, where you can practice and get some insight. Um, behind me, you can see that this is a hackathon that um, we volunteered at in 2018. Um, this was the, Get, it was the hackathon at GitHub headquarters. And it was both in person and online. Um, hackathons are great for practicing building projects in a very short amount of time. Um, another thing that we've done, and I'm going to change my background again so you can see, is that we've hosted workshops. And behind me, you can see the board says data structures, a human friendly introduction. Um, this is good for our community to come together and think about okay, what topics do we want to focus on? Who in our community can talk about this? So we've organized like um, workshops on data structures and how to explain them in like human terms. Um, we've also had speakers come from from um, their jobs to talk about what they do in their role. So there's software engineers, but there's so many sub-disciplines like, oh, I'm interested in DevOps or what does it mean when someone says they are a product engineer? Um, but meetups are, my biggest recommendation, if you want to network, even though we are in a pandemic situation, you definitely want to become a familiar face at any meetups that you find helpful. Um, once you become a familiar face, it's easier to network. You can possibly organize um, a meetup for the group that you are introducing yourself to. You can be connected to mentors. Um, you won't be just like some random showing up and saying, hey, can you give me a recommendation? Um, I'd be happy to talk about that since um, I think a big factor of me being able to find a job after completing General Assembly is the fact that I went to several meetups and it really introduced me to a lot of really cool people. You think that the meetups led to your uh, job? Um, so I think that um, it was in fact, it was, there was multiple factors. I think one of the best things I did was go to meetups to constantly introduce myself and what I've learned and what I can bring to a team as well as um, it didn't directly lead me to like the hiring manager and say, oh, Jason, here you are, here's your job. But I really did teach me like how to present myself to this audience if I'm coming from a world that has nothing to do with code. Um, it also taught me like, what should I be on the lookout for? Uh, how to approach mentors. Um, there's a lot you can learn at meetups. And uh, my suggestion is to really find the ones that you that you feel the most comfortable in. That makes total sense. Got it. All right, this next one. How do we decide what kind of job to pursue for our first job? Some say go startup and you can learn a lot fast. Some say go like to more established companies for more mentorship. What would be both of your advice? And it doesn't have to be the same advice, but. <laughs> Um, well, you have to look at your situation. Um, if you're coming into a place where you have corporate experience, where you've worked for another company and you're just wanting help with the tech part of the transition, like ensuring that you're able to use their tools and be productive on their team, then I would then I would focus on trying to find a company and communicate to the company that that's what you need or what you're looking for. And, and talk to the company about their processes on bringing on new talent. Because some companies have a lot of resources to invest in getting new talent up and running and then other companies don't. And you may find that startups are more friendly to that or startups are less friendly to to that. My first, not my first tech job, but the tech job I had that brought me to San Francisco with the startup. And they wanted me, but they didn't have the resources to continue to train and invest in getting me up to speed, especially after the person who hired me 
who was running the team decided to take a job somewhere else. So that's so after that person left, they decided that they no longer wanted to invest in getting someone up to speed. They want to have someone there who could just do it. So make sure that you find out what the company wants and needs and make sure that their values or their goals are in harmony with your goals. Bringing it back to that communication again, so important. Jason, anything to add? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, when I'm looking for a job um, and I'm starting my career, I really think want to think about like, what are my goals out of this first position? Am I really wanting to stay somewhere for a little longer um, or do I want to learn a lot? Um, so with junior developer positions, I'm seeing that sometimes you have these very, very early stage startups and you also have these apprenticeship programs from some of the larger companies. And I really, my advice is like, there's no one size fits all. Think about your own goals. Like if you go to the startup, you'll probably be responsible for a lot more and you'll most likely have to wear a lot of hats. Whereas if you go to this apprenticeship program, you might be slotted into um, the work that the apprenticeship focuses on. Um, like you might be working on a customer success team for a while before making the switch to development. Um, really think about the pathway that you want to cons that you want to follow when you're looking at the options in front of you. I think um, in case anyone's interested in my opinion also, um, I think it kind of brings me back to what Sam has said in the past of like, you don't necessarily need to be very picky about your first job because um, I'm just thinking back to myself when I was looking for my first job, I didn't know <laughs> um, that would have that would have taken a lot more self-awareness than I think I had about like my skills and what I was going to be able to um, bring to the table. Um, but you can always try something out and go from there see if you really don't like being pulled in a bunch of different directions or if you feel like maybe the place is too big and, and you want to have more impact or something That's, that is definitely good good information it's it's similar to something someone else told me is where it's sometimes if you don't know what you want sometimes it's better to know what you don't want yeah that is huge knowing what you do not want that is a great um, list to generate too. All right, then moving on. What resources do you find helpful with keeping up on current trends in the industry? Do you have any that you typically turn to? Um, yes, yeah, so um, I like subscribing to a lot of newsletters. Um, so there's a hacker newsletter, uh, which is pretty great. Um, Free Code Camp also has an email newsletter. Um, that focuses on learning and resources for training. Um, in addition, um, these are specific to communities that you might belong to in tech, such as Out in Tech or Techeria is another um, popular one. Um, so the newsletters are great because they're usually aimed at people who are already working in tech. So you kind of get a better idea of what's going on and what's being like in the news of that community. Um, I know that um, YouTubers are also a good place to look through, but uh, my caveat is to really curate um, YouTube content to uh, match what you are looking for. And just like newsletters, you wanna find out what's relevant to you. It definitely, it's, it's worth investing the time to curate a list, like Jason said, of whether it be newsletters, Twitter, people to follow, YouTube channels, and narrow it in. Like once you decide what skill it is you want to learn or what type of job that you want, follow those individuals or follow those uh, content creators be, and be careful about investing too much time into following them, right? So I think uh, what Sam said brought up rabbit holes because I know you can invest hours upon hours into any of those mediums. <clears throat> so like you do with your, your, your learning schedule, dedicate just a specific amount of time to do those things so that you don't invest half your day tweeting and retweeting and liking and, and sharing things. 
It definitely has a way of pulling us in, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Does what it's designed to do. <laughs> um, all right. Do you, do you have any people that you follow on Twitter that you really recommend or, or YouTube? Yeah. Um, I mentioned one earlier as Brad Westfall. He's one individual. I need to uh, open up and then I'll, I'll read a couple of names. There was a person on YouTube, uh, Function, Funk Function, but I think they stopped creating content, but a lot of the things that they created are still of value. I'm trying to think who else. Give a second, it's almost opening. I follow a lot of people who do things with GraphQL. I follow, I think it's Black Tech or Black in Tech on Twitter. And I follow a person named Paris. What is, and she does a lot of things, especially with helping individuals. Okay, here's her name. I'll put it in Twitter so that you all can see it. Awesome, thank you. I'll put it in the Slack, I mean. That's her, her handle. And uh, right. she's a good person to, to follow. All right. Um, next one here, what's a good way or what's worked for you to practice talking and explaining code? Uh, I'll go since I'm already unmuted. Creating YouTube videos has helped me. I, and that was one of the things that I was doing before I got into tech. I've always been working on creating YouTube videos since I think YouTube's been around, at least I've been aware of it. So that's one way. Um, listen to yourself. Don't just create content and let it just sit out there in the ether. Listen to it, listen to your mannerisms. Uh, I noticed for myself, I don't know what it is, but when I say certain words or P's or S's, you can hear my lips smacking is the term that my mother called it when I was younger. Be wary of or be aware of how many times you say um or whatever it is your ad lib is that you use to give yourself that beat. Uh, is your voice the type of voice that carries? Listen for those types of things. Are you enunciating? Ask other people if they understand what you're saying when you say things. I'm from Indiana. They say we have an accent or we don't have an accent. For some people, it's hard for people to understand me with my Indiana accent. And I have to repeat certain words or put more emphasis on certain sounds when I say certain words. So those are all things to be aware of and creating YouTube videos or videos on any medium is a way that I practice and get feedback from others on learning what, what helps me or makes me a better communicator. That's an awesome tip. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Cause it really does just come down to practicing talking out loud. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to practice it. Yeah. Um, I think um, you have also if you can, you can get all the tools you need to practice just use your voice recorder on your phone and listen to it in your headphones. And that's probably how most people are gonna hear you through a mobile device. So that may give you a better idea of what, what they'll hear. And also you can, um, uh, doing pull requests, I think really helps because people are gonna ask you questions like, can you explain what this does or, <laughs> um, in PRs, people ask all kinds of questions. So it's like, um, it's a good way to learn how to um, explain your code. Um, so you can do that by um, uh, working on open source stuff. Uh, Leanne, um, I forget the links. Brady, do you remember? <laughs> she gave examples. Um, it's probably in her YouTube video from the previous time too. I think Brady just posted it on her YouTube channel. <laughs> sure did. Um, and all the questions are timestamped. So I think there's 
questions about open source stuff in there. Um, but also you can do stuff like prank, because when you do prank, you're like interviewing a stranger and then they interview you. So you got to talk about the code that you write. So that's another way to do it. Because then you can see if the person understands too, like um, what you're trying to explain. Okay. This question is for Awful. What made you decide to move back to the States? Uh, well, which time? Because I've, uh, after being away those five months when I first started learning, I came back because I was running low on funds. So that's one reason. And I didn't know what else, nowhere else to go. So when I first started, the goal was to spend a month in each country and then go and work my way down through Central America into South America. And the goal was to do three months abroad, come back for a month and continue on. But I ended up getting, spending just five months abroad and I didn't get bored, but I started to realize that I was just, abroad, like I was just living abroad, which was great. But I figured it was just time to come back. You know, it was really nothing. Cause I went to, to one reason to prove that I could do it and just have the experience of living abroad. And then after doing it, I had accomplished that. So I needed to come back and do some adulting so that I could finance doing whatever it is I wanted to do. So that's why I came back. I get that. I lived abroad also. I kind of, I mean, picking up and moving sounds so fun. And I loved that idea. And then I started to realize I kind of got lonely, like not knowing people when I was picking up and moving. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, life happened. I'm, I'm back. I was, <laughs> anyway, that's not about me. <laughs> I wasn't asking about me. Um, this next question is, I have only been able to do online meetups since starting coding due to COVID. Any networking tips for online meetups and or in person once they are safe? I guess beyond, um, there was already a tip of like dropping your LinkedIn with a little reason of why you might want to connect with the person. Um, anything additional? Uh, yeah, well... What I've started doing, what I've been doing since the world has been closed is attending localized meetups that aren't where I'm at. So I still attend the San Francisco Free Code Camp meetups and I host meetups for Phoenix JavaScript for people who are usually in the Phoenix, Arizona area. But we get people from Canada to pop in, people from Pennsylvania, from all over the world that that want to network and we welcome with open arms and I have yet to be uh, asked to leave a group because I wasn't within their jurisdiction. So definitely attend all the virtual events that you can. Most of them are free and you can network that way and look for, once you decide what it is you want to do and the, the skills and, that you want to learn, there may be a community of people who are doing that. So you can join that community and learn with them. And that's a one good way to networking. An example of that is the Gopher Slack. I wanted to learn Go. And there's a whole Slack specifically for Gophers. And they share jobs, they share interview tips, they share interview questions. I believe someone created a, a whole repo based on Go interview questions and Go um, quizzes or programming puzzles. So that's a good way. And those are the people usually in those communities or who manage those communities who are hiring or wanting people to join their team. And like Jason mentioned earlier, once you've been interacting within a community, even if it's not in person, you develop a reputation. And if they like interacting with you in that community, even if it's virtually, they'll probably enjoy interacting with you on the job. And those are the people who will be making those decisions. 
Yeah, and also you gotta invest time in um, participating in the community, right? It can take a, a while to develop genuine relationships with people. It just, it does, you don't just generate a relationship with someone just by going to like one meetup and not even talking to them, right? Um, so just hang out in the Slack, participate in the discussions. In our Slack, you can join the virtual coffee channel. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, also related to JDHH, um, like the people who end up staying until the end and can come off mute and introduce themselves are the people that I get to meet. Like um, there's a lot of people that I find out after weeks and weeks that they've been attending and maybe finally on the seventh week or something, they'll introduce themselves. I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like you're just a brand new person. <laughs> so that's always funny. Like um, just by participating at some point, that's the key. Yeah, even on like Twitter and stuff, just by like, if you just keep commenting on somebody that you like, there some developer you look up to, like maybe one day they'll start responding. <laughs> yeah, and with what I'll jump off what Brady mentioned earlier, like if you invest seven, whether it be events or days or weeks coming to someone's event and you don't say anything, and then you eventually have something where like you want a job on that eighth week, like you could have just said hello or replied to something and over the seven weeks, those little events can help you build that reputation, can help you build a rapport, like Sam mentioned, to where when you actually need something, it's a lot easier to help you than if you show up and you've been around this whole time but no one has interacted with you. It makes it more of a challenge to take a risk and gamble on bringing someone into the team when you don't, you have nothing to go off on, but just a resume. And also um, like, I'm just, I'm not the only person that you would ever need to connect with, right? Like um, I tend to have a really busy schedule. So there's a ton of other people who would be great to network with here as well. It's not just the people who are organizing any sort of meetup, um, but when I do have the time, I do love to get to know everybody who comes here. <laughs> yeah, also in our Slack, you can create your own channels and make your own little groups and stuff too. I know people have done that. There's like a hundred days of code channel. Some group of people from our community just made it because they wanted to like have some accountability with each other. Um, it hasn't been active lately, but um, but yeah. In our Slack, you can invite people, you can make your own channels. We don't lock any of that stuff down, so yeah. Okay, um, next question then, what did you do to maximize your learning early in your career? Um, so to maximize learning, um, like, I think this question might be asking like, how can I learn the most amount early in my career? Um, that's why I'm feeling. So the way that I try to learn as much as I can is really go back to the source of what I'm trying to learn to. Often this means documentation, tutorials. Um, underneath a lot of programming frameworks and languages are key computer science principles. That's once you have those foundational ideas down, you can adapt them to new languages and frameworks that you are learning. Awesome. For me, the thing that helped me learn the fastest was to have a plan and, and stick to my plan. And you can adjust your plan as you go. Like if something isn't working, don't keep doing it. You know, adjust your plan so that you're not, you're getting the most out of your time because that's your most valuable resource at the moment, right? Until you get to the point where you can have money working for you, then you need to be as efficient as possible with your time. So what I would do is I would learn something and then try to teach it to someone else. And if I didn't have someone that I could teach it to by either 
annoying my mom or a sibling or a family member, I would make a YouTube video or a blog post of me explaining it. And then, you know, if you read it and it doesn't make sense or if someone sees it and they respond back, I don't get this, then you can then know that, all right, I need to do a better job of explaining this, right? Because I'm missing this one person or this one type of person isn't quite understanding what I'm saying. So that was one thing to help me. And also reading documentation and reading other people's code, preferably someone who has, uh, is better at coding than you are so that you can pick up their good habits. Yep. So uh, I dropped Lee Holiday's um, Halliday, his YouTube channel earlier in the chat. Uh, so if you want to see other people's code, he has pretty good code. So I, I enjoy watching his YouTube videos. Um, but another thing I would suggest is figuring out how to cut out distractions. Um, so if you binge watch Netflix or something, just suspend your Netflix <laughs> um, while you're trying to like ramp up before you get a job and cancel your Netflix. Um, anything that will like make it harder for you to like sit down and binge watch something all day. Um, that's like one way to get rid of distractions. Um, just make it harder to do whatever usually distracts you. Like when I went to dev boot camp, I told all my friends and family to pretend that I didn't exist anymore. <laughs> so I asked them not to call me, not to text me, not to email me, nothing, just to make it easier to like concentrate on what I was trying to do, which is become a developer. Um, so. That's a great point. I had to, like, unfortunately for my job, I need my phone for push notifications for multi-factor authentication stuff. And I have like a goldfish brain. <laughs> I'll pick up my phone to work and look at this notification, but then I'm like, oh, YouTube. <laughs> and um, I had to move all of my apps. I had to like create different pages. So when I open up my phone, only that auth, only the things that I need for work are on the first page. And then I have to swipe a couple of times to get to other apps. That's helped me in like turning off any single note, every notification that I possibly can. Um, Cause I get off topic pretty easily if I don't try to really focus. Yeah. Yeah, at Dev Boot Camp in San Francisco, they had a no phone policy. So for the whole day, you couldn't take out your phone. It couldn't even be on the desk or you had to put a dollar in a jar that we had. Um, so it's really taboo to even take out your phone. And you couldn't go to Facebook. You couldn't go to email. Like in the browser, you couldn't go to any social media. That was all forbidden at, at Dev Boot Camp. Um, so just again, getting rid of distractions. Can I borrow these rules, please, Sam? Yeah, I, I didn't make it. That was Dev Bootcamp. <laughs> okay, I'm using it as part of my class now. Thanks. So yeah. Follow-up questions um, for Jason. Oh, hi, Claude. Um, hello. Um, what, what common elements are like the, the underlying principles? Like you mentioned like learning um, learning those like common patterns across like different frameworks. Like what are, what are like some of the things that you learned like learning, um, I guess so, like underlying principles that cross like different frameworks? What are yeah. the, those? Um, so let's think about like what features are common to programming languages. You have loops, you have control statements, if and else if, and so on, functions, objects, classes. Like those are the things that we see in JavaScript and in Python and in Ruby. Those are the kinds of things that I identify like um, if I see like how JavaScript does classes, and I see how Python does classes. I understand that they're both trying to make objects based off something, right? But the way that they do it, the way that these languages implement them are different from language to language. And it's like that with frameworks too. If I am looking at React, I'm seeing that it's a component based front end library. And I go on to view and I see how they manage components and state. It's going to be different but they both have the end goal of creating a user interface, right? Also follow, follow up question for Awful. Um, what was it? 
so what did like your learning journey look like in the beginning and like how did you revise that and then like why did you pick like those certain items and then like how did you adapt I guess uh <clears throat> well in the beginning I just consumed as much free content as I could and it was a bit all over the place I started with rails um then I started doing stuff with code.org and Khan Academy and with Khan Academy, you're using JavaScript, but I had no idea how to actually apply it outside of Khan Academy. So I wasted lots of time there. Um, but, but after that, I focused on building things that I would use. And that's where my journey stayed as far as just building things that if no one else cared about this tool, I did. So when it came time for me to do something, I cared that this tool would exist. And I cared about the feature that I was working on implementing for it because I knew I wanted to use it and I needed it for this specific thing. And then that would then translate over in the interviews for when I was asked questions about the things that I was doing to prepare myself for the job or prepare for the interview. I could passionately speak about these projects that they could care less about. The first project that I worked on was an app to keep score for kickball games. Because before I started getting into tech, I was the, I ran an adult kickball league where I was living. And we did everything on pencil and paper. And there was really no way to track stats long term. And we like most sports, people are confident in their skills and they like to compare themselves, but there were no stats to say that this player was better than the other. And I felt that I was better than all of the players in my league and I wanted to prove it. So I was destined or I was, my mindset was on proving that. And I felt that if I had the stats to prove that I kicked more home runs or I had more doubles than anyone else in my league, then that would end the discussion. So that's, that was my journey to prove that I was a better kickball player than anyone else in the world. <laughs> awesome. That is but yeah, awesome. you can, you can build apps for anything. Um, I went to a Christmas party once and my friend built the app for the white elephant <laughs> like gift exchange. So like you can just make even small kinds of apps just for any kind of thing. Wait, was the app the white elephant? No, it like was, the gift. I forget what it, it, had, it had something to do with the white elephant. I, I just remember he made an app and we are all laughing at him. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. All right. So uh, next question then here. Oh, yeah. Here's the follow up question. So were you the best kickball player? Well, I'd like to believe I am, but like most sports, there's art and science to it. And once you reach a certain level of proficiency, the arguments are pretty much mute, right? You're pretty much arguing over who's better, LeBron or Michael Jordan, you know? But okay. I will say this, in my defense, I was the first and only player in my league or any other league that I've ever heard of that was paid to play on people's team. and was incentivized to play in certain tournaments with other players. So I was the world's first professional kickball player. And so that that's where I'll end that argument regarding on who's the best. Point taken. <laughs> you got to put that on your LinkedIn if you don't have it on there. Your website, come on. <laughs> <laughs> put that for your LinkedIn headline, Wild Chris. <laughs> Hey, um, that would that would get you interviews if you were a junior developer going for your first job that would make your resume stand out i think right? if you had that on your resume it would make it memorable at least i would remember it if i was looking at the resume i'll definitely be making some adjustments jason i know you had something to say yeah i know we're heading towards 1 30. i just want to go through any more questions from our audience today um you mean like to the next uh next question in slido 
Um, yeah, we can look at that. Or if there's any other questions coming in from the chat, um, that way we can get to 1.30. Cool. Um, yeah, we have, we, we probably won't make it through all of them. Uh, this might be the last one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is the next one up on the list. Your term finishing school from earlier in the, in the meetup. Do you recommend going to a boot camp as a five-year self-taught web dev? Oh, this person is a, is a five-year self-taught web dev and they want to just become better, it sounds like. Um, so my answer to that question is um, assess your skills. Um, do you feel that you can get a job based on where you are right now? Five years is plenty of experience for a lot of amazing roles out there. Um, as for that, I would really have to ask myself if going to, if investing in a boot camp is worth it, if I have five years of experience at this time, since these boot camps are tailored towards getting people into early career level positions. As for my term finishing school, it's coming from like my favorite metaphor of like a finish, like an actual finishing school that used to exist where people would learn like dancing and social graces. And that's kind of like where my expression finishing school um, came from. All right. Okay, we've got maybe a couple more minutes. Um, do you have any tips for preparing for technical interviews, but not the algorithm technical interviews? So I guess maybe that would encompass um, if, unless you have a different idea, I'm picturing something like uh, where people will say, how does HTTP work? Or like, um, if you send an email, what's actually happening behind the scenes? Okay, Brady, or let's go with that. Um, so for those kinds of questions, and they, those do pop up, I would research um, as much of the company's code base I can, just to know like what I would be working on. Um, like their tech stack, um, what are some common issues that they're working through. A good place to find those out is to look at the company's engineering blog if they have one. And if you're talking about front end like uh, interviews, you can DM me on Slack and we can do another one. Um, I've done mock uh, front end interviews with people from our community. Um, you gotta be okay with me recording it though <laughs> and letting other people watch. It's more scalable than me having to do it one-on-one -on -one with every single person. Oh, this question is wondering, how do we evaluate meetups for a good fit? Every group has off weeks. So is it about committing to three meetings or five? That's an interesting take. Um, yeah, I'll let you all give your thoughts. Uh, what do you mean by good fit? Is it like the like the values of the organization or the types of things that the meetup does? Because some meetups are strictly focused on giving talks, some maybe on working on things, and others are just about creating a place so that you can work on stuff. Like when I was in San Francisco, there was a an Oakland meetup where people would come and sit at the library and work on their own projects. And there was very minimal, very little talk at the meetup. It was mostly working on your project. You may ask for help from someone, but so that might not be the type of event that you want to participate in, in this stage in your career, or it might be the perfect place. So I'd like to know more about what it is they're looking for when they when they meant they say that question also i don't think there's a magic number and it depends on your situation on like how much time you have like some people have families and stuff like that so yeah i usually for me i go on meetup or like and i just sign up for whatever sounds interesting for me like i browse the calendar for like the next few weeks on meetup um because they recommend stuff that you might like um, the more meetups you jo join the the better recommendations are, I think. Um, so there's that. And then just finding out about events on Twitter and LinkedIn and whatever Slack communities you're in. And I just sign up for a whole bunch. Like you're not required to go. Like if something else comes up, then um, 
then just don't go. <laughs> uh, try to update your RSVP though, just to so that uh, organizers have a better idea of how many people are coming. It doesn't matter as much for the online ones, but it still helps. Yeah, I would say don't put a minimum, like don't say that you have to go to three or five meetups. If you get there and you don't feel the vibe, then I would say leave, right? Go invest time in things that yeah, definitely. Yeah, I tried out a whole bunch of meetups and then I just go to a bunch and then I eventually I find the ones that I really like and those are the ones I, that I go to regularly. Yeah, as important as it, it is when we stress to find things that like projects that you enjoy working on, like meetups are even more important to just make sure you're really interested in whatever you're spending your time on. Um, yeah, it could also be just the community too. Like you, you just like the community, so it's just some place you go and hang out. Cool, cool. Um, we're at four twenty nine, so I'm thinking maybe. Unfortunately, we'll have to skip this last one, um, but we could stop recording at this point. And if Jason and Anthony are able to stay around that'd be awesome we'd love to talk to you no pressure though if you have other other things